Let me just, uh, well, this is just a uh, quick reminder of uh, where we are and what, uh, what the main theorems are. Uh, here's a list of groups, um, and I guess the only one, uh, so brain group, symmetric group, happy class group, orientable surfaces, and non orientable surface, are the properties of free group. And then these uh, W's were connected sum of um, SD cross SD to spheres, and then many, many connected sum of those uh, together. And then we basically have uh, two theorems. One is just you know, the different morphism of those, right? Uh, that is in the William. And um, just recently, we also have a similar statement for the discrete the version of that group, uh, this group of uh, galaxies and So I'm sort of uh, slightly prompted by um, questions uh, last time. Uh, so uh, you know, maybe I put down a few papers here because I mean this was sort of classical. And then there are uh, two results maybe that led to these next two um, Precursors of these next two results is a uh, one I showed uh, basically that this space here could be an infinite loop space, and then in the paper with Matsu, we actually uh, suggested it might be this space here, which I will explain today what this is, and then later on, of course, Matsu quite proved it. So, but it, before it wasn't, uh, well, it was uh, firmly believed this couldn't be an infinite loop space, so. Uh, that was sort of a, a necessary step to get to uh, actually trying to prove that it is this particular space here. And then uh, Martin Weiss proved that theorem, and I think it is fair enough to say that this uh, second proof by Galatis, Martin, myself, and Weiss sort of simplified the steps quite significantly uh, in this proof and then. Um, further work uh, went from there. Okay, having said that, a um, bit of uh, advertisement, um, I now want to actually try to explain um, where these spaces um, in the second part come from. Well, actually, uh, I haven't really explained what is the relation between these six. Um, so, when I um, was invited to the uh, workshop here, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it has been a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, one of the things that stuck out uh, as um, a theme for the whole uh, program was um, configurations and loop spaces. So that's really what I want to do. And I, from here, I want to construct a map 
from Sn. So over 30 means k points in zero. Yes. So this is. Oh yeah. This is These are sitting in Rn. Right? So this is a picture of k points sitting in Rn. And out of this one picture, I want to construct a map from Sn to Sn. Yeah? The degree k map. And what you do? Well, you take this picture, you pick nice name and goals of the points that is joined. And now uh, you interpret this Sn here as just the um, one point compactification of Rn. And so you have this picture here. And the first thing you do is you collapse everything outside um, your neighborhoods that you picked to a point, to a base point. So really you get from here a map into the patch <coughs> of um, N <coughs> and K. So each of those spheres being really one of these folds uh, compactified at infinity. So this gives you a nice collapse map and uh, so of collapse, fold collapse. And finally, we use here just the fold map, meaning that every sphere is just mapped to itself by the identity and of course, uh, a generic point here is now going to be covered k times, so I get a degree k map. So it's very straightforward. And the theorem, of course, is that uh, if I do the group completion on these configuration spaces and let uh, n go to infinity, but we can even fix n. Why is this a monoid? Well, if I have one picture and another picture, I just squeeze one picture to a half, um, one half of the uh, blackboard and put the other picture on the next side. So that gives me a, um, well, I can make it into a monoid and I can take the group completion and the theorem, this is actually uh, in this general attitude due to Siegel in the 70s, is just the, and the space of n loops uh, of Sn. So in particular, this gives us a way of mapping uh, breaks and um, um, the symmetric reason is symmetrical. Excuse okay. me. Uh, excuse me. Uh, from your definition of the map, uh, I'm sure I'm missing mm -hmm. something, yeah. but it, it looks like you get the same map for every choice of k points. You're collapsing the outside, you get a wedge, uh, a bouquet, and then you're mapping each element in the bouquet by the identity. That's correct, only of course, uh, for a given t here, where, the, where it goes here, it will depend on which uh, k points are k. Right? So a given t here, well, if it is outside the, the k points and the neighborhoods, it's going to go to the point at infinity. But with a different configuration, this might maybe uh, might be in part in some neighborhood, in which case it goes to some other point. So the map actually does depend on your specific. But it, it's important to understand this map because the next one is going to be more complicated. But the same thing. So is there uh, other questions? Yeah, so how, yeah. What, what if the, I mean, it seems like the radii of the spheres around the points have to get smaller and smaller as the points get closer. That's true, yeah. So um, there is a, um, so I chose a certain radius here, and um, the claim is that you can choose the radius continuously, so that this definition makes sense. So indeed, you can. Uh, choose the radius, you can set it to be uh, what, maybe uh, one half of the minimal distance between any two points. To be safe, let's do this. Yeah. But it's a, it's a continuous function. This uh, um, R is now a continuous function on the um, points themselves, or on the configuration space.
so in order to fix this R, uh, I just to make sure um, I look at all the distances and make sure uh, I think it's more. So yeah. in, in a classical case, right, you actually have the brain. So what happens to a say, elementary brain? What's map in omega to a first two here? Um, you mean when n is equal to 2? Yeah. Um, well, then you get a map from a sphere to a sphere. Um, so oh, the rate is actually an element in pi 1. I mean, so... Um, these are models uh, for n equal to 2. This is a model for uh, <coughs> the rate k. Okay. So, the break is a pi one in here. Yeah. So you're asking what happens if I move one point around to another point or something. Well, this gives me some sort of path in the loop space here. <coughs> so that would be, is it something in like pi, pi three or pi uh, No, it should be pi. Uh, pi, pi uh, sorry. Pi. Um, if I uh, take actually a break, meaning I uh, just swap these two, then what you will hit is the um, uh, the generator, so pi one of omega to s two is actually going to be exact. Uh, on the other hand, pi one of omega infinity s is going to be exact of two. So um, that's what you're going to hit. It's a path. So, uh, uh, maybe, uh, is that what you're asking? This generator here is actually the Hoffman. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, it's Hoffman, uh -huh. which uh, after suspension is only um, degree two. It's a top. So, at the end, the elementary twist. So, at the end, the elementary twist go to the Hoffman. Sojo was asking about the, where the elementary bits is sent to this representation. Yeah, so the, um, the braid, which is a path after all, yeah, the braid um, that you get by swapping one point uh, with another point in here, if you just have two points here, that is a path, um, and over here, this will be a path in this space a loop in this space, and that loop uh, is um, generated by um, it's a map from S1 into omega to S2, which is, uh, of course, and since it's based, it's really a map from S3 into uh, S2, and I'm claiming this is the omega. Okay. So the paths you get from swapping here goes to see how oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I already mentioned here when n is equal to two we get the break and of course when n goes to infinity we get sigma n. Okay. So uh, now for surfaces I want to um, Generalize this picture and do, but do the same thing here. So uh, let's take D. Well, really, D is equal to 2 for surfaces, but uh, the picture is not going to change later on. So the main point, the main idea here is actually to think of the, um, well, um, the points in sigma n uh, as. Um, well, I have a good model of B sigma n, that's what I'm saying. Sigma n is a diffeomorphism of k points, and I have a, a beautiful model of um, B sigma n as this embedding space. And that's what I want to do here as well. So I want to um, remember up to homotopy, B of um, the Mackin class group is just the same 
as a different morphism group, so also the classifying spaces are homotopic. So I want to have a nice model for B diff, and the way to get this is just like up there. I take the embeddings of the surface at G and map it into some large Euclidean space. And I let um, N go uh, to infinity in a moment. So N plus uh, 2. And I take here the limit as N goes to infinity. Now if I just look at this space, that is actually a contractible space by the Whitney embedding there. So that, you have to fix that. So this is a contractible space, just the same as Latin K points, all the points in the line, it is contractible. This is contractible, and it has a free action of the diffeomorphism group. Because uh, when I have an embedding, I just pre-compose the embedding by a diffeomorphism to get another embedding. Right, so really, um, and then of course the embedding uh, this is completely free. So now I have <coughs> a contractible space with a free diffeomorphism group uh, reaction on it. So quotient, which is this, is therefore a model for B diff. <coughs> So now, uh, in this case, I want to map into some other fancy infinite loop space. And I'm not going to even define this because somehow the map will tell me what this is. And I'm just following the idea here. So now I have my surface, here's my surface, sitting in uh, R and plus 2. And I do the same thing. I pick a nice neighborhood of uh, this uh, surface uh, and maybe the way to write it uh, is a nice neighborhood. Which I call N of N of F. Surface is F. <coughs> Now, um, this will now help me, so I can also think of this, of course, as a normal bundle of F in R and plus 2. And again, I want to um, get from here, map this up here, into what we call omega infinity, M, T, S, Two. In particular, in the limit, I want to think of, um, I want to have here a map from Sn plus 2. This so might be a limit, and going to infinity, maps from omega n plus 2 into some other space which I will have to define. And here's the map. Again, I collapse everything following my uh, picture there. The collapse goes this time into the compactification of my neighborhood. That's exactly what I did there. I collapse everything outside here uh, to the point at infinity. This is again compactification of n plus 2. And I collapse everything outside, and now I get really just into the, this neighborhood compactified, which I now identify as the normal bundle to the surface. Okay. This wouldn't be quite good enough, and now I somehow need to get rid of the particular uh, case that. Here I was looking at k things, I wanted to go to just one. And here I um, have a surface underlying here, and I want to somehow forget the surface. So I need to have the global <coughs> picture. And um, 
this is what I do. I'm looking, um, well, let me write down the map. When T is any point in here, well, I sent it to the point at infinity, and T is not in the neighborhood. And otherwise, I want to remember something. And this is what I want to remember, the local structure. So let's assume that T is actually in my nice neighborhood here. So here's my T. What I want to remember is the closest point, so the point that corresponds to the surface on it, or the X. And then I want to remember the, um, the difference between T and X. So really, I want to remember the tangent space at x to my surface. And then I want to remember the vector v, which is really the difference. So it's element normal to the tangent. Okay, so really what I get, what is this? Well, I get an element in the Grassmannian of two planes in R n plus 2. The tangent plane is just a two plane in this R n plus 2. But then I also have this normal um, um, vector, so really over the Grismanian, of course, I have the canonical bundle, two-plane bundle. I take its orthogonal complement. Right, so V is something in this normal bundle. But, and now I can find, find so that I can sense things that we're going to So in other words, V really, uh, this is a, um, a tom space of this bundle over the two planes. So let me write out here gamma two and over the Grassmannian of two planes in R and plus two. And I should really take the oriented two planes. <coughs> so what is uh, the Grassmannian? <coughs> you know what way of writing it? It's a linear embeddings embeddings of a two-plane, an oriented two-plane, into R n plus 2. And then just as before, I'm going to mod out by the um, map GL2 S, GL, GL2 oriented. And over this, point in here is a plane, and I can put in the plane uh, itself, which gives me the canonical uh, two-plane bundle. And the orthogonal complement, that's to be remembered, this has dimension n, namely n plus 2 minus 2, not n dimension 1. So, I have now my whole map, and what I stick in here is exactly this. And that's the definition of space. Right. So really, I haven't um, used very complicated things. I looked at my surface, looked at a um, uh, neighborhood of it, and now every point in my picture I send to a certain, um, to a point in this picture, this normal point, namely. I t if I'm outside, I just send it at the point of infinity. That's the C of application. And when I'm not there, I just remember the plane, the tangent plane, and this vector V. That's it. I'm sorry. When you say computation, it's the one point computation. Yeah, one point computation. Generally, when you have a Tom spectrum, Constructed in this way, there 
homotopical splitting is it's, it's not anything known about homotopical splitting? Um, well, uh, it's this particular one. Uh, um, there is a splitting roughly of S omega. Okay. MSO2, ordinary MSO2 splits. But it's not, this is related to unoriented cohorts. Or oriented cohorts. It is uh, related to oriented cohorts. Um, and that's why there's an NPM. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a, let, let me point out two differences. Okay? When you know a new cohorts, uh, in, uh, well, let me look at it from what map do we use here, from here to here. You basically use the, um, use the classific uh, classifying bundle map for the tangent bundle of okay? It's a tangent bundle that uh, sort of determines somehow. And in normal cohorts theory, it's a normal bundle. That's why we put a T here. Um, and then there's another difference. There's a shift of this bodice. Um, uh, I mean, I literally do mean N plus 2 here, because that's where the collapse comes from. But of course, this bundle here is dimension N, uh, just N. So I have a, a shift by 2. So the Tom class, if you like, of this bundle should be in dimension n. But I shifted uh, my loops, so I actually pushed it into mine degree minus two. So I don't see the top class. So, so it's a di um, dimension shift, yeah. and, um, and, and also uh, using the tangent rather than the normal one. But in the limit, if you readjust uh, the dimension shift, then that's just an uh, involution on uh, the corresponding Tom spectrum. And is transversality buried somewhere in this construction? Um, ask <laughs> uh, I mean, and there's nothing uh, I'm using specifically here, but it's just uh, there. It's very simple minded. Sorry, could you just say a little about why you choose the tangent bundle? Because that, um, well, that's what I'm led to, right? Uh, but um, I can say, try to say something. Actually, um, give you a little bit more um, feeling, and then come to that question. Back to that question. Uh, at the moment, it's a map that, uh, that we have at hand, and that gives us the most information. And that's in some sense what you do when you look at points. Okay. So. Classes for um, vector bundles. 
So, <laughs> how do you construct a characteristic class? And this is something that was, uh, of course, known, and really uh, Miller and Morita and Manfred uh, came up with this. So you look at uh, some bundle, and let's assume the fiber is your surface S. <coughs> well, what kind of constructions can you possibly do <coughs> that's natural with respect to F? So one um, map people have looked at is a map that um, takes the vertical tangent bundle of E. So you look at the tangent bundle of E, but you just uh, look at those that are um, along the fiber. That's a two-plane bundle. So this gets you into uh, the Grassmannian, or um, in other words, BSO2, because it's Lorian. So the kappa i classes uh, were designed to be actually, well, this is a two-plane bundle, oriented two-plane bundle, it has an Euler class, so it's to take E of this vertical tangent bundle, right? You take it through the power i plus one, that of course, um, this class now lives in the cohomology of E, right? The bundle, this uh, vertical tangent bundle, is something that lives on E. But I want something in B, homology of D, and in order to go down, you just integrate over the fiber. So now this is a class in the homology of B. And that's where it comes from. So here, you're clearly using the tangent. That's, I guess, my answer. Okay. So what I wanted to um, do actually, uh, I will keep this on the book. But before I uh, go back to that, I wanted to now calculate for you the rational homology of these spaces. How do we get at those? Right. Um, so I want to convince you that these spaces, this, despite the funny name and uh, maybe construction, are actually quite uh, reasonable. So let's look at the uh, homotopy groups of um, my space. <coughs> let's look at the case homotopy group of omega infinity and T S O. Uh, well, actually, let's do it generally. Okay. Because of course, this construction here, I could have replaced D by any, the uh, two by any other D. And um, let's try to understand it rationally. But anyway, so this, well, when I have a limit space like that, I can always any finite computation of a you know, homotopy group will be, I can do that in a um, finite case. So this is going to be omega n plus two, and then gamma two n. So I can restrict myself to a finite one, and then I look at this, well, this is really pi naught, of course. Uh, sorry, this is pi k plus n plus 2. The loops you add it here, or just this compactified uh, vector bundle, the Tom space. I haven't really done anything at all at this point. Now I'm going to use something. And this is an old theorem of uh, SER. And I have to right here, rationally, they are the same, okay? So what does Sir uh, say? Well, Vernal, um, the Rurich uh, theorem, which says um, that if I don't have any interesting homotopy groups, the first interesting homotopy group is going to be isomorphic to the first non-trivial homology group. Sir improved this 
and said, well, um, if, I, if I don't have anything interesting up to dimension k, then rationally, the homology uh, and the homotopy are going to be the same in dimension, not just up to k, but up to 2k. So this sort of identity is, um, holds actually um, in double the dimension. Now this here, we note it is actually um, a tom, a one-point compactification of an n-dimensional vector bundle. So literally, it doesn't have, it's sort of like an n-fold suspension of something. So this doesn't have anything interesting going on up to dimension n. So as long as k plus n plus 2 is less than 2n, which of course I can choose by just picking this n large enough, we have that rationally this is the same as k plus n plus 2 homology of this space. But now we are in a very good situation because remember this is really the tom space of a vector bundle and there's a tom isomorphism which uh, tells us actually that um, the tom space of a vector bundle, so it's sort of just a suspension, doesn't change the homology. So I go down by dimension k uh, n, and choose the homology. And this is now the homology of the base space. But the homology of the base space is the Grassmannian plus r n plus 2. And as long as n is large enough, this of course is just the homology k plus 2 of um, b s o 2. Well, b s of 2, that's the classifying space of s1, that's the infinity. Now, this is very well known, so we understand this. So rationally, we understand the homotopy groups um, on the exchange by two. Let D. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the D should have been a two, uh, or, or the two should have been a D. Sorry about that. We have the rational homotopy groups of these are completely understood, and now we just uh, need to understand how from the homotopy groups we can go to the same. Um, homology groups of homology. So that's a uh, term by Milner Moore. Milner Moore classified all Hopf algebras uh, over the rationals. And in particular, when you have a space with some multiplication, an H space, that is, um, its rational homology is a homotopy group. And it's a Hopf sorry, it's a commutative Hopf algebra. And commutative Hopf algebras are actually just um, three algebras on the primitives. And the primitives are the um, homotopy groups. So by the number, we get that the homology of the homology either way of our um, space um, omega infinity m t s o 2 which of course is now the cohomology of uh, b gamma <coughs> infinity component this is actually just the three graded algebra on the homology of BSO2. Only notice that of course we have a shift by two. So really we should shift think about everything bigger than two. And this is Russian. Sorry, that happened. So in particular, what does this mean? Um, 
we already said the homology here and, uh, and everything gets shifted down. The homology here we know of course is uh, given by classes in degree uh, in all even degrees and this is now the free algebra on it, free Q algebra, which is of course a polynomial algebra since all of these have and this is of course um, the mantle. So I labeled the, uh, these classes kappa i. It's not yet obvious that these i indeed the ones that I defined here. But uh, excuse me. Slightly confused. SO2 is the circle. SO2 is the circle. The classifying space of the circle is CP infinity. That's my point. And the cohomology of CP, CP infinity, infinity is, is generated by one element, yeah. degree two polynomial algebra. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you're taking the free, oh, you're talking about the whole thing, I'm sorry. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, you so get yeah. an extra, no, 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 no it's, it's like okay. a okay. So. Thanks. You have thing here, you have something in every even degree. You shift things around and up, and then you still get every something in every even degree. But now you have to take the graded polynomial algebra on it. And that's that. How, how do you know that this is a primitive? Why is it primitive part? Oh, that's just the general, uh, so this is what Milner Moore says. Uh, Milner Moore says that um, if you say, start with x, which is, um, say, a loop space. Then uh, the cohomology of this thing, uh, maybe I do double loop space. Then the um, homology of this has uh, both a co-multiplication and a multiplication, and they're both commutative. Um, so rationally, uh, this is generated by the primitives, and we just know that the primitives um, are always given by pi star. Uh, okay, so uh, what is that? Um, it's yeah, it's a lean part of it, and you look at the point it uh, uh, product. Uh, yeah. So what's the whole algebra structure? Of well, I mean, the, um, the core algebra section in general here is always just given by the diagonal. Um, if you want me to, I'm not sure what I can actually tell you exactly what it is in terms of these things. But it's, it, you know, when you have a loop space or a double loop space, then, or in any uh, homology of X is a core algebra given by the time. So and one is the other is loop space is uh, bi commutative, so every uh, co algebra structure is three. Yeah. Co algebra structure is just oh, you're right. You're right. Oh, that's it's bi commutative. Right. It's okay. It's, sorry. Yes. But <laughs> excuse me, uh, I I some I'm somehow lost the. Uh, uh, at which point uh, have you proved or suggested that the Tom construction based on tangent spaces actually induces a rational homology as a Ah, I, I lost that. So I haven't proved. Uh, um, this is a so much advice there. I haven't uh, so I you can try just to, to believe that this is the right construction because it induces the original more J's No, um, okay, so, um, all right, here's the next step. I, I won't be able to prove the maximum step. It's just it's not, true. Not, it's, not trying what I'm doing. It's good to know that it's true, nevertheless. No, no, no. Exactly, okay. so I'm taking that as a given in some sense, but I want to explain why, and okay. you'll have uh, the map. Why? No, thank you very much. I'm, I'm much better. I think much better. Now. Okay, I haven't. Um, but I was going to try to. Um, right. 
there was going to be uh, <coughs> another section, namely about transfers. And maybe I just very briefly say it and then uh, finish off, because half of it is already here. Okay. Um, so, Here's a, a section that's called transfer. Okay. Now, Karen already uh, mentioned yesterday transfer mass. When you have um, a covering, say by uh, a finite covering of E of B. Then, of course, you get a map on uh, local change. So, in Hatcher's notation in his uh, book on algebraic topology, he calls it U. So, pick U, a very small uh, covering, oh, sorry, a covering of B with by small balls, so that over every little ball here, you have uh, however many. Then you get a map on chains. <coughs> from here to here, by just taking one of these and just map it to the sum of all the things that cover it. And then, of course, the composition, you go back by pi to C U of B, it's just the multiplication by C N, by N, if it is an N sheeted cover, okay? Now this has actually a generalization, a very broad generalization. Namely, you can start with a bundle where this is now, F is just a manifold, um, compact manifold. And indeed there are versions which allow you to take F to be just um, well, something of homotopy type is finite CW complex. So basically something that's finite. Something so that the Euler characteristic in particular is well defined. Now, there are maps, stable maps, going in the other direction. So in particular, you get a map uh, from B uh, plus into B, B plus, which is stable, so it exists only after many um, trans um, suspensions. And it gives rise to a map from V plus by adjointness to omega infinity S infinity E. <coughs> and this transfer has the same sort of um, property that uh, one uses in the transfer form. Uh, finite coverings, namely, when you go from the homology of uh, B to the homology of E and back again, this whole map is just multiplication by the Euler characteristic of F. So it's a very strong theorem, very general theorem. Okay? So I want to use this transfer map. Let's call it S or status transfer. In this situation, and this is how uh, we first came up with the map, right? Because somehow the transfer is what you might call a wrong way map, an Umkehr map. And that's exactly, of course, what the integration over fiber does as well. It's a wrong way map. So the integration over fibers is actually, in homotopy theoretic terms, just this map, the stable <coughs> transfer. So, with this in place, what do we have? We now have a map from B plus into, now using the transfer, so it's, this uh, exists stably, and by a jointness, I can go into omega infinity s infinity of E, 
plus. And then, of course, I want to push forward into, by this map, into omega infinity, S infinity of E S O 2, or C P infinity. And of course, here, this, I take it to be the universal um, bundle. So this is a B diff. I think of this as B diff of some surface G. So now I have a map from B diff into this free infinite loop space on CP infinity. I don't seem to have uh, these more complicated things out there. However, there's a very simple map from this into omega infinity, S infinity of BSO2 plus. Why? This map, well, I just look at this part, a particular path. And I just add the canonical bundle to it. This is a two-plane bundle. I can just add it inside the uh, comp construction, the compactification. So then, if I have the uh, two-plane bundle and its complement, I just have a trivial bundle, a trivial bundle over my Grassmannian, and loops maps into it. But the trivial uh, bundle, compactified, is just a suspension. So really, I have here the suspension on, on my base space, PSO2, and loops into it. So this is a very simple map there, which is exactly um, this composition here. And uh, one can prove, actually, it's not very difficult to see, that uh, this transfer map, if you analyze it more carefully, it's actually factoring through what we call a pre-transfer map, which is duct space up there. So it's this map, really, that we first studied. And the idea is now to detect as much in here as possible by, um, well, that was our first idea, anyway, by looking at uh, B, C, D. If you have a nice surface, then you can look at finite um, automorphisms, and you can, with a little bit of luck, you can find um, cyclic groups. You know, choose your surface big enough, you can uh, map uh, any cyclic, any big cyclic group into it, and indeed, um, this sort of approaches BS1. Yeah, because you basically look at CP infinity here. Um, and over the limit, you really have a map from BS1 into here. But BS1 is the same as BSO2. Using that this is an infinite loop space, we knew that already. The, 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 um, Z cross B gamma plus infinity is an infinite loop space. So that means actually that the map we get here, we can extend over omega infinity, S infinity, <coughs> and I'll study this composition. And that was actually uh, very useful and it gives you a lot of uh, information, including um, um, P primary. So that was the sort of the first idea. But that's not the proof of some um, conjecture either. That was just a way of getting close. So I, I, I'm all over time. I, the lecture course was supposed to be about chromotopy methods in, um, in uh, geomet well, of geometric groups. And uh, I think the transfer just has to be part of that, so that's one of the reasons I'm going to put it.